Hey everyone, welcome to Encounters USA. If it's aliens, UFOs, Bigfoot, or Dogmen you're looking for, you came to the right place. Now listen up as we listen to some of the latest encounters. Hello, everybody. Welcome to Encounters USA. I'm your host, author Matthew Hines, and we have an excellent couple of podcasts. We are going out to the Bigfoot Festival in Marble Mount, Washington, which is near the pass uh, over the Cascade Mountains on Highway 20. So it's going to be an amazing two podcasts. We are going to see... um, author and Bigfoot researcher Tom Cantrell. We are going to talk to him. We're going to do an interview. We are going to listen to one of his lectures, and we are going to see an amazing uh, set of pictures that he's going to present at the festival. Also, we're also going to hear yours truly talking at the festival on two different occasions about things that we've come across on Encounters USA. So it's going to be an amazing podcast, and let's not waste any time. If you guys haven't yet, think about subscribing. Uh, You can support us by going to hindsight.com and purchasing one of my books. And um, if you want to support us in any other way, tell your friends and share the podcasts. All right, then. So let's go to the Marble Mount Bigfoot Festival. Hello, everybody. Welcome to Encounters USA. If you're listening to the podcast, you might not know it, but I am standing at the Marble Marble Mount Community Club right here. I'm in Marble Mount, Washington. Right behind me, the Bigfoot Conference is going on, and we're about ready to go on inside and take a listen to one of the gentlemen who is speaking here has had some great encounters. So we're going to go in, we're going to check it out, and we're going to possibly get some people to interview. So it's going to be a great podcast. We're going to have some very interesting stories and hopefully some very interesting speakers for you to listen to on the podcast. So let's go inside and let's check it out. I thought the best thing to do when I arrived at the Marble Mount Bigfoot Festival was to find somebody that could help me and show me around. All right, so I'm in. I've got my stamp. Hey, Mina, you want to come in here? So I've got my Bigfoot stamp. (laughs) This is Mina. You want to get in here? Hello. Mina, what's your role in this little... I'm a helper. I help Seville because she's a, um, a friend of mine. And I'm keeping the tabs and the cookies, or the donuts, the coffee, and stuff like that. I keep an eye on that guy in the blue shirt. Looks like he's chowing down on everything. Mm-hmm. Holy cow. <laughs> so, okay. You're going to ruin your appetite. Yep. <laughs> okay, Mina, well, thank you. After schmoozing it up with the organizers of the conference... I was allowed to not only record a segment of Tom Cantrell's speech about Bob Gimlin and Roger Patterson and their Bigfoot encounter, but I was also able to interview him right after his talk. It's just absolutely excruciating. It's just almost destroying because. Paul was a very nice, very simple man, you know. His word was his bond. Bob Kimlin, uh, my best male friend in the world, still can't understand why people don't understand what happened that day. He'd never seen a track that he thought was real until that moment. You know, Roger had, had evidence, and he, Bob just went along because he liked to ride, and he, he uh, took care of the horses and packed, and and uh, Paul will be 88 years old in October, and he still trains, teaches people to drive teams. He was still breaking and training horses until two years ago when he had a bad wreck with a mule. And his wife told him uh, he had a choice. He could either train horses or live at home. <laughs> I said, well, it may not have been a whole new address, but it would have been in care of the doghouse. I would have been sure. <laughs> 
But uh, you know, so that's what we deal with. You know, uh, it's kind of funny. There's a group on the internet called the Coalition for Reason and Thinking and Do It My Way. I think this is the last part. I may have got that last part a little wrong. But it's all about, you know, their way or the highway type thing. And I'm their poster child. I and my mentor, Arla. I'm the Pope of Wu, and she's the high priestess, according to them. But it's so funny, because every time they attack us, book sales go up. <laughs> it breaks my heart. <laughs> and, but it never has bothered me, because they don't know anything. You think I would trade that afternoon with them for everything I know? Not a chance. Not a chance. Yeah. That's going to live me, with me through the next two lives. Although I had been given permission to interview Tom Cantrell after the presentation, it was a little bit difficult because I only had a few minutes in which to interview, and Tom Cantrell is a very, very popular author. Hello, everybody. We are sitting here with none other than author Tom Cantrell, and we are sitting in the Marble Mount Bigfoot Festival right now. We've got a little bit of commotion going on in the background. Hopefully, our directional microphone is just going to pick us up and not the background noises. So, Tom Cantrell, can you, uh, first of all, introduce yourself by telling us, I see you have a lot of books here. What are your books about? All of my books here are about Sasquatch in one way or another, with the exception of one. It's just a, a historical novel that I wrote. But uh, Sasquatch has been my love for many, many years now, and, and my research has fed me a lot of information, and uh, since I've retired, I've had time to actually sit down and write, and I found that I really enjoy it. So, it's been a long way. That's, that's okay, so talk to us about your... You've, you've experienced uh, Bigfoot. You've had encounters yourself. Oh, yes. I have a more than fair to admit, probably. All right. Well, but, before you start talking, can you give us a background on where you're from and where these uh, these experiences happen? All right. I uh, was born and raised in Northern California. I uh, joined the Navy in 1961. And in 1968, the Navy transferred me to Washington, and I got out and I stayed. And I've been here ever since. Uh, first up on the Olympic Peninsula, and that's where my experience with them began, and kept growing. And, and uh, my first encounters were there. All right, can I can I stop you right there? Uh-huh. I grew up in Swim. Uh-huh. Can I can I ask you where were your first encounters on the peninsula? Uh, in the west of Swim, out uh, in the uh, Dickey River area, north peninsula, the northwestern corner of the peninsula, actually, between the town of Forks and Port Angeles and Mia Bay. Okay, and it was a visual encounter. Or? First, first were other things, and then it led up to visual. And uh, it finally, oh, it was early '70s, I suppose, when I when I had my first visual encounter. And then '70, '71, I lost that, and then it, it just uh, kept growing from there. Uh, I spent a lot of time in the woods. I was a graduate forester, and so I spent a lot of time in the woods alone and quiet, and that's the key. That's right. I had a logging company, but very seldom saw anything around that. Because you're making too much noise, number one. Number two, your mind better be on what you're doing and uh, not what's around you or you know, carrying your own basket. But, uh, but that's, you know, being out in the woods alone, uh, doing the work I was doing, uh, that's, that's where I started to encounter. Okay, and um, I, I keep saying this every time I talk to somebody that says they've had encounters by Squint, is that growing up there, I've never heard of anybody having an encounter, but you bring up a very good point that when you're out logging, um, you have to be very careful of what you are doing. You have to be watching those trees, what other guys are doing. You're not looking for Bigfoot, really. No. So, so it, you know, when you're trying to actually work out there, then I guess it's a little bit 
uh, a different situation. So you were employed as a as a as a forest service official. I'm not forest service, but I have, I have I got a degree in in forestry, and I did a lot of consulting work for timber companies. Uh, Especially our bridge uh, design and, uh, and road design, okay. and uh, that got me out. You know, I would have to go in and do a, a bridge set survey, and I maybe five, six, seven miles of the nearest road, and uh, in there for all day or a couple of days sometimes, doing you know, doing my work, and I learned really quickly to sit down and do a rough drawing right there rather than going back to the office and find out you put out the measurements and have to hike back in again. Uh, dead time was not my favorite thing. And so that's when I'm, I started seeing. I'd be sitting there quietly drawing, you know, writing, and you would look up and see the around the tree. Okay, so what we're trying to do on Encounters USA, if we're looking for habits, we're looking for social groups, we're looking for anything that can give us an insight into what's going on inside the mind of these things. Are, are you looking at a male creature or a female, or do you know? Well, I, to me it doesn't matter, but uh, I've seen both, I've seen them together, I've seen them separately, uh, and mainly, I, I don't care whether it's male or female, I just want to know that. Uh, and in the past 10 years, I've learned how to do that. And I'll go to see those in the past. But uh, I found, number one, stop anthropomorphizing. Their mind is not our mind. Uh, they have their own way of thinking, their own way of doing things. Uh, our, our knowledge does not count for us. Uh, one of the things I've worked on most. Oh, your announcement. One of the things I most readily worked on. All right, Tom, I think we were back up in the Olympic Forest, uh -huh. and um, you were talking about uh, anthrop anthro uh, anthropomorphism. Yeah, yeah but, but you know, we tend to really do that, so you seem to have an answer. Who, who are they if they're not anthropomorphic? Who are these creatures? They're a human hybrid. They're alike us in many ways, but they're unlike us in many ways. Uh, I, I believe they are more intelligent than we are. They are certainly more, more well-developed in some areas than we are. Uh, we diverged about 35,000 years ago. We moved indoors, they didn't. Uh, and when we moved indoors, we gave up some of our abilities. Uh, things we didn't need anymore. Okay. Tom, I have to ask you, are you familiar with the Melba Ketchum study? Oh, absolutely. Yeah, yeah. yeah. yes. Okay. And, and you know Melba? And... I know Melba personally. Okay, because I had the honor of interviewing one of her friends. First interview they've done since the study, basically. And... Um, it was really interesting in that, you know, so you're talking about that they are, um, you're, ta you're basing your opinions on the study about them being human ancestor and that human ancestor There's less being people. female. <laughs> All right, well, I think we're getting ready for another drawing. All right, this is... This is a raffle, so get your raffle tickets out. Most exciting interview I've ever done. <laughs> So far, we run a little loose. Small time. All right. Well, while we're waiting for the raffle, Tom, uh, I, I'm an author. I like to promote authors. So tell me a little bit about your books. Well, first of all, I want to know, as an author, what inspired you to write the first one? The first one was an author. Uh, and I wanted to tell the story. Of okay. Everybody have your tickets out? The last three numbers is zero, nine, two. She wins Bigfoot uh, Boulevard. Yeah, I wanted to tell the story of Sasquatch, but I wanted to do it in a way that the haters couldn't hate. Okay? Yes. So what I did is I wrote a novel and I included that story in that. That way when the when the haters wanted to hate it, hey, that's a novel, I can write whatever I want to do in there. You know, that new Nazi colonel in there, I could have made him gay and he couldn't have done a thing about it. You know? uh, so that, that's why 
to that book. There was a story I wanted to tell, and I just developed the Sasquatch into it. Everything in the book about Sasquatch is true. Okay. Observe behavior. Uh, the story is not true. Yeah. And uh, what is the title of that book? Uh, that's Ghosts of Ruby Ridge. It's set in northern Idaho in the Ruby Ridge country of northern Idaho. Okay. Interesting. Interesting. All right. So, um, but then you went into publishing nonfiction. Right. So, um, what, uh, what, what point are you trying to get across? This is entirely, <coughs> entirely nonfiction, and it's a series of encounters. My encounters mostly, but there are a few other people that had particularly interesting uh, uh, things happen, so I included them as well. And then I finished it off with a few essays, uh, also uh, things like uh, being part be, being part of a whole and not just uh, uh, you know living for yourself. Uh, an essay on early homesteaders in the Walla Walla area and their life with the Sasquatch. Uh, just the humanity, what they, you know, how they live. Uh, and things like, you know, the science of it, uh, intermemoral index, which if you examine that, I learned this from Dr. Melvin, uh, initially, but if you examine it, it is actually proof positive in your existence. Scientific proof positive. Uh, intermembral index is a ratio of your arm length to your leg length. And in primates, that is a constant. Okay? With us, that ratio is 72. In uh, chimpanzees, it's 104. In gorillas, it's 122. Okay, the arm is 122% of the length of the leg. Okay. In Sasquatch, it's 84. Okay, take, take a look at uh, Patty. Can the Patty see anyone so? Measure it up. Okay, folks, in about five minutes, we're going to have a gentleman named Morgan is going to be coming up and telling a story about his encounter with Sasquatch. So in five minutes, he's going to be here. Well, that puts the pressure on, doesn't it? Yeah, that's, yeah. Got to, you got to perform. And you got the police out. <laughs> They're busy today. All right, so you have, um, you've talked about, oh, well, we'll fix that. So you, you've talked about Olympic uh, mountain encounters, and, well, let me start into this. The people I've talked to that have encountered Bigfoot on the Olympic Peninsula seem to get a relationship. Like, have, you know Rich Germo? I know Rich. Okay, so, so people that find or are found by Bigfoot, they seem to have repeated, and, and you fall into that category as well. Do you have... Have you had encounters in this area in the Cascades? Or oh, absolutely. absolutely. Okay, I, okay. Well, let's let's get out of the the, the Olympic Mountains. I want to hear about Marble Mountain. I want to hear about what's going on in this area. Our, tomorrow, my presentation is going to be on an encounter that I had eight miles up the river from the Cascades. Area. Okay. Uh, we had a group come over from England for a week. And uh, we had one right in the camp, kneeling down over two people in sleeping bags. And we have a very good photograph. Oh boy, you have a photograph. Mm -hmm. Okay. Are we going to see the photograph tomorrow? Mm -hmm. Awesome, that's amazing. Mm -hmm. All right, so um, how many books total do you have, Tom? I have, I've written ten books. Ten books? And, and as I said, I, I promote all my authors, so available on Amazon? Okay, available on Amazon, right under my name. Uh, or you can go to my website, okay. uh, .com, Okay. and uh, they're available there as well. Get them signed through there. Okay. So let me ask you, um, I don't want you to give anything away, but tell us about what is your, if it's, it's, it's the one you're just talking about, you don't have to give it away, you save it for tomorrow. Give me a memorable encounter that you've had. That, that one was really great. It happened, uh, it happened Labor Day week in 2013, so two years ago. And uh, Adam Davis, uh, extreme expedition team, came home to New England. Uh, 
Lori Simmons, lived here in town. Lori Simmons, I, I, I've been looking for her for a year. Okay, she lives in Boston now. Okay. And uh, I kind of expected to see her this weekend. But uh, Lori had me come up and I worked closely with her on her, her investigation. We have some fantastic stuff that's going on up the river here. And uh, she invited Adam and his crew over. Uh, from Friday through Monday, they, uh, we, uh, we got footprints were cast. They were around us the whole time in camp. Wow. And, uh, but then Monday night, we had the, uh, the uh, trail camp up over camp. We got two exposures of that. Him leaning down over the top of them, leaning over, and then another one much more straight up, and you can see the breath exhaling from from his mouth. Wow! All right, now this brings up a couple of behavioral issues. Mm -hmm. First of all, they don't show up in front of camp, in front of tra trail cams. No, they, well, they, they, they did. The only you. trail cam picture I've ever seen was good for water. Wow. Okay, so maybe his desire to his curiosity. I think it was more than that. I think it was teaching. Teaching? Mm -hmm. Teaching what? That they're there. They're real. Ah, okay. So, and this is Lori Simmons? Mm -hmm. Okay, so Lori has had, uh, from what I've seen of Lori, she has uh, like a family that she kind of follows. Mm -hmm. Is this part of that family? Wow. Wow. Yeah. I, I need to get a hold of Lori. She's like the, uh, the, the how do you say, the um, like pot of gold for, for Bigfoot hunting up here. Um, just because I, 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 because the story I've heard that she interacts with a certain tribe. Get, get a hold of me uh, on okay. Facebook and I'll get you a okay. that, that would be great. She's been, she got married to Simmons, so it's not Simmons anymore. So. Okay. That's, pro that's probably it then. But yeah, I'd like to get both of you on my podcast. Are you ready to start? Yeah, we're going to do okay. that. And, and if you want to talk to me, I do. I'll, do it, I'll do it in the back. Okay. okay. So yeah. All right. Well, Tom, thank you. Yeah, I'll get a hold of you. Ladies and gentlemen, I want you to welcome awesome. Morgan. Morgan's going to come up and give us like a story here. Thank you, Morgan. I'm going to see you back at the end. We could always catch up. See you at home. See you at home. <laughs> it's yours. After my interview with Tom Cantrell, I was very fortunate in being able to get an interview with Marble Mountain Bigfoot Festival organizer, Savella Khalil. All right, everybody, we moved a little bit away from that last setting with Tom Cantrell. Uh, it was a little bit noisy inside of that uh, hall. And it's very humid in there. Today it's a very warm day. Of course, these warm days are going to be finishing very quickly. And I'm sitting here with the, um, I guess we're going to say the, you, you put on your, I, I don't want to say the organizer, because you, you insist that Tom is organizing this. <laughs> but would you just tell us your name and tell us what, how you're involved with the Marble Mount Bigfoot Fest? Okay. My name is Savella Khalil, and uh, I've been interested in Bigfoot for many, many years. And I moved to Marble Mount around seven years ago, and I started meeting people, and they were telling me their stories about Bigfoot and how he is in this area. And um, people have told me about Bigfoot that um, is actually family pods and different things like that, with and how they communicate with them and how they talk to them. And it appeared to me that um, we're at the Marble Mount Hall, and I'm also on the board of directors with the Marble Mount Community Hall, and we we needed things to uh, to to show off our town and show off our hall and show off that yes we do function like every other city, and but a lot of the people were afraid to tell their story because everybody thought they were crazy, and so I started then this this. About a year ago, I started a club, a Sasquatch club, and things like that. And I said, well, I'm going to have a Sasquatch uh, a festival. I could not believe when I went on Facebook and started doing my own podcast and doing different things like that, how many people have encountered Sasquatch and everything. So I said, I'm going to do a festival. I'm going to do it for this town of Marble Mount so that people will know that 
Uh, he lives in the area, Sasquatch lives in the area, and I also wanted to bring attention to all the wonderful businesses that we do have here in, in Marble Mount, such as the restaurants and how great they are. In fact, there's one restaurant here in, in Marble Mount that has a meal that's called Bigfoot. And it's a it's a chicken fried steak, and so I said, well, you know what? That's great. You know, everybody likes Bigfoot, and and the restaurants, com you know, are the same, and they they believe in it too. And there's so many people that know about it that that's how I started it. And um, when I was online, there's so many clubs all over the world, and people all over the world that talk about Bigfoot or Sasquatch or Yetis or Awas or whatever the name of them are in Florida. It's a, a, a swamp ape, and you know, so they have all these different names. And I said, "Wow!" And and then I all of a sudden I started I started investigating in my own way. I haven't encountered any, but I started investigating my own way, and um, I came across Tom Cantrell. And I told Tom Cantrell that I was thinking about having a festival. Now, this is going back quite a few months. And I told Tom Cantrell that I wanted to have a festival. And he says, I'll be your speaker. And that's it. It was just he he willingly just opened it up. And so for over the last six or seven months, him and I have been working together to, to put this on. And he gave me the ideas of different things and get this and do those different. And that's how it all started. So this is the first year. This is the first year, awesome. but I've already got people lined up that want to do it again next year. Yeah, because you've got a pretty good turnout. I, inside, I see at least 30 to 40 people, yeah. and, and you're pretty remote. I mean, you're. this is the last stop, as you see on the signs, the last service for... 72 miles before. Yeah, 78 miles to Winthrop. Yep. Yeah. So you got to go. No, no services. Yep. So we're the last one. So if you come to Marble Mount, you've got to get gas. You've got, If you're low on gas, you've got to have something to eat or whatever because you're driving another hour and a half. And it's pretty twisty and windy roads up through Diablo and places like that. It's beautiful, beautiful. A lot of wonderful hiking trails. But beware of this Bigfoot because they he's up here. Yeah. And that's what I want to kind of talk to you a little bit about. Um, is the geography here, is that, as we said, this is the last town before you basically head up to the pass. And um, no civilization and lots of area for Bigfoot to be roaming around. That's correct. You think that, that most of the people here, like you just introduced me to a gentleman that has Bigfoots that brought a new baby. Yes. Um, and so are these kinds of encounters typical for this town? No, no, no. Uh, a baby is only born to a Sasquatch couple every seven years. So every seven years there will be a baby born. And, um, and, and, and I, don't, I, don't know, I don't have the answer to that. I know Tom Cantrell might have the answer to that, but I don't. And um, this gentleman, he's going to be speaking shortly, and, um, and he encounters them, and he speaks to them. He knows the language or something, and he talks to them. And every spring and every fall, they, bring, they, they come down to his property, which is only about five miles from here, and, um, and they speak to him. And this last, this last fall, they brought a baby, and they showed him the baby, and they said, here, like, introduced him to their baby. And, of course, a baby for a Sasquatch is not like a baby of a human. And, you know, it's, it doesn't weigh 7 pounds. It's more like 150 pounds or something as a baby. So, yeah. Wow. And so I don't want to go too much into the details just in case we happen to um, are able to talk to this gentleman. But um, is, is, it a, is it the mother and father bringing the child? The mother and father is bringing the child. Wow. And there's a, several encounters where... They, they, the child is out, and the child is more inquisitive to the human. So, so usually, if you see the see a child, he's out playing or something like that. And and but the mom and dad are real close behind, and and they're not. You go into their into their territory, and you have to figure how many thousands and thousands of acres that have not even been. Uh, walked upon here in Washington State, yeah. and so they have plenty of room right. to be there that people's never encountered. Because you 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 just can't drive on the road usually and see one. You have to hike in yeah. and 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 to to a, a remote area, and then that's where it is. That there's a place here um, that not only has this other gentleman t talk to me about it. That's about five miles from here, but then then I. I understand through a lot of uh, conversation with other people that uh, a certain mile markers and and even the lady that delivers our mail here in Marble Mount in the winter time she came and she says 
uh, that I have to go up way up by Bacon Creek and, and look at the footprints in the snow. Wow. And I went up there and took pictures of the footprints in the snow that, that where they, they crossed over Highway 20. But you have to remember, in the wintertime, they close the pass. Mm -hmm. So you can't get over Highway 20. So mm -hmm. then that even gives them more freedom right. to, to wander. Right. Well, that's amazing. So what's your personal opinion? Do you want you want to have an encounter with the yeah. Bigfoot? Oh, yeah. or, oh yes. Oh, I, I, I just... I think that it would be like anything, you know. I mean, people always say, "Well, they're not real. They're not don't believe in them and stuff." And why do you believe in in Sasquatch? Uh, you've never seen one. And I, and my answer to them is, I believe in God, and I've never yeah. seen Him. Yeah. So it's it's just you know, it's one of those things. I I want to, and because the more you learn about them, the more the more you want to learn about them, mm -hmm. and the more you want to be able to you know, uh, see one and, and, you know, touch them, you know. Um, I remember a few years ago, I always thought the Tasmanian devil was a cartoon. Mm -hmm. And then I went to Australia and they took us to Tasmania and mm -hmm. I saw a Tasmanian wow. devil. So, so the things are, so I had never seen it before that and I always thought that it was fake. Or the glowworms. I was in New Zealand and you went down in a cave and there was actually glowworms wow. there. So it's, you know, people... People shouldn't be so skeptical, mm -hmm. you know. I mean, I grew up thinking those things weren't real, that it was a, somebody's imagination and cartoons, and here it is, they were real. Yeah. And, and so Sasquatch is real. Yeah. Or Bigfoot or Yeti or what, whoever you want to call them, yeah. you know. Yeah, well, uh, as I've said before on my channel, that this is for people who have got past that, whether it's real or not, we're looking for behavioral characteristics mm -hmm. we're looking for family units and we're looking for uh the same creatures uh in different locations just so we can kind of track them so yeah it's all very interesting and um it's it's really nice that you've put this together because it looks like everybody's having a great time oh yeah it, it it's fun and and we're having raffles and door prizes and some of the things uh a lot of the sasquatches that are around here the big one like the painted one over there and the ones on the signs and things i made them I made the uh, the sets the, the the beanbag thing games and stuff like that. So I'm just fascinated. I actually a few months ago purchased from these people over here that are making the metal ones and things like that. So so I'm just fascinated by them. And it's and it's interesting to see how many other people are fascinated because I put the big foots out on the signs mm -hmm. and people that stopped and actually took pictures oh, yeah. with it with the big foots, you know. Yep. And at first when they stopped and they pulled up and I was thinking, what are they doing? <laughs> and stuff. There's one story that a, a, a lady friend of mine told me and she said that they were out fishing one day and they were up, you know, they walked in and were camping for a few few days and they threw in their fishing pole in this in this little small stream creek uh, whatever anyone calls them and um and they heard this splashing going on and they they were like what is that you know and splashing and they said here came a young uh, juvenile sasquatch up in the water and he was he was catching fish and right behind him was his mommy and daddy wow. and he took the fish and would give it to the mom and the mom would show the father and he would look at it and then throw it back in or take it with them wow. you know so that that was a behavior that they had that um that they were they they ch pick, picked and choose what fish that they would take that hey, Sabella, is how many of those little sticker things are on the well, on the table just two okay. just to, i'll tell you okay oh you're Sorry. fine you're fine. Dine. Okay. All right. So, anything else? No. That's okay. All I wanted to know. Okay. So, is I was going to ask you what's your favorite Bigfoot story from here? Is that it? <laughs> that's that's one of them. I mean, there's there was another lady told me a story about um, her daughter and her uh, her daughter's boyfriend, and they were out in the woods and they went camping for the weekend, and they were um, sort of messing around, and the the daughter came up. And looked out the window, and there was Sasquatch sitting on a wow. on a stump, watching every move that they made. So, wow. so they're curious. They're just as curious as you know. And they and watched them. And I kind of thought that was kind of a cute story, you know. So, mm -hmm. and and she never wanted to tell it, but she told it to me, you know. But she never wanted to tell it because she thought it was a little embarrassing and stuff. But okay, it was okay. That was um, one of the stories. Yeah, and that that's uh, it's really amazing, especially the the fish one. Um, like it, the the one at the window is they tend to be observing, 
Mm -hmm. the, the one with the, the fish, it's kind of like, you know, it's like a parenting yes. kind, kind of situation yeah. where, no, you don't want that one, or maybe mm -hmm. it wasn't big enough, maybe it was a, I don't know, female, male, who knows. It, it could but, have been a, a female, and they said, no, we need more fish, so let it go, you yeah. know, a salmon or something. It, I, don't, I don't know. That was just the story that they said. But the people that, that saw that, it scared them, and they took off. So they didn't oh, wow. continue watching them as they went up, went up the creek in the water. They were all of them were in the water. The parents were just a little far behind. Okay. Or the male, female, older male, female. Okay. So then I got a couple more questions for you. Um, the a lot of people say, oh yeah, they have like this uh, sixth sense. They can you can't sneak up on them. Whatever you you they they won't um, let you take a picture with a game camera. But these people obviously kind of just happen upon them. And I've talked to other people, same thing. So my question is, what do you think they are? Are they, do you think they have some kind of powers beyond us? Yeah, I or, think or that they're can't? sort of telepathic. Okay. And, and it's a, a different kind of a level plane. And so, and, and, and I believe that they can probably come and, um, come and talk and see you before you see them. Mm -hmm. Excuse and, me. Oh, yes. And I'll and talk and here. and and I think I honestly think that they um, they know they know you're there before yeah. you know they're there and so then they're curious and they watch you so in almost all the stories it's like one's poking its head out behind a tree and another one's poking its head out behind a tree and they do that and then they go back when they think you're looking at them so then they come out and when they think you're not looking at them then they come out um, I think that they that that's them and. The st a lot of stories that I've read and people telling me that they do not um, have an English language, that it's a kind of a cross language maybe between Native American and Asian language, and and they talk that way. It's a kind of a talk chatter da -da 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 type thing, or, or, or the screaming thing. And that's mm -hmm. why I had a screaming contest here, you know, a Sasquatch screaming contest. But... Um, or, or they rap on the on the wood, but they say what I understand is if if they're rapping on the wood on the on a tree, and you rap on a tree back, they will answer you. So it's a way of them trying to communicate with you. I mean, but most people don't know what they're saying. But yeah, you know. yeah. So you've seen Ron Moorhead and yeah, oh, yeah. All, all those people, and okay, so um, yeah, it it really opens up this whole deal of of you know. What, what are their characteristics? Um, what are they able to do and all that? Mm -hmm. and, and for an Encounters USA, that's our next step. I mean, that's what, what we're looking at. Is we're, we're trying to find out what these things can do. And, and by asking people like you, you've heard things and, you know, you know people that have seen things, then we, we can put more uh, stuff together. So mm -hmm. um, before we go, let's, um, I want to make sure that thing is even running. I guess it is. Mm -hmm. um, it kind of, because of the sun, it's so right here in the <laughs> we're cooking in the sun for the sake of journalism but how can um so you how can we get a hold of you if we want to participate in the festival next year well i have a i have a email account and i'm also on facebook the facebook is northwest sasquatch 2 uh dot club and you can put that in and it comes up on facebook and and i and i have a club that you can join and on Facebook, of course, I ask you questions, you know, to see if I'm going to have you in the club. Mm -hmm. And then um, also I have a Northwest, and it's not Northwest spelled out, it's just NW. Um, and same with Facebook, uh, Northwest Sasquatch 2.club at Outlook.com. All right. Is my email address. All right. So I keep wanting to say Sil Sylvia. S Savella. Savella. So Savella, Savella Khalil, mm -hmm. um, thank you very much for spending some time with us. No problem. And I wish you luck with your festival. It's really great here, okay. and I'm glad I finally made it up. So Sure. So thank you. And thank us. you for coming. Right. I appreciate it. So okay. Savella Khalil for, uh, thank you. for the Marble Mount Bigfoot Festival and Encounters USA. No festival, Bigfoot, UFO, or otherwise is complete without its vendors. So I spent just a couple of minutes going around and talking to some of the vendors who were selling their wares at the Marble Mount Bigfoot Festivals. Come and have a listen as I talk to a couple of guys who do plasma welding. All right, so I'm sitting here with a couple of vendors and uh, 
You guys make what? Let me guess. Bigfoot cutouts. I do metalwork, yes. These look really, really sweet. And um, they're made of metal, you say? Yes, 14 gauge, old world steel. Wow, and they really, really look sharp. You have, are you like Henry Ford? You can have any color what you want, as but long as, it's black. as long as it's black. <laughs> well, wait a minute. What's a steak? what's this? I see a silver. Oh, okay, that's the garden steak, huh? All right. So then you got your Bigfoot footprint, Bigfoot. And how much would one of these set me back if I was so inclined? Yep. All right, pretty good deal there. And where would I put that? Uh, don't, 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 don't make any suggestions that I can't put on my podcast they're, they're here. Extremely heavy, so they're made to sit outside even in the wind. They won't get blown over. All right, great. Wow. So nice little lawn ornaments. They'll take over the that pelican and the and the trolls. All right. Well, I'm going to let these guys do some business. Well, thank you, gentlemen. Thank they you. really look sharp, and I hope you guys get a lot of business. You got keychains, and um, we got an email address or something we can contact you? Yes. Wing and Gold at Outlook.com. All right. So we're going to take that. We're going to post this on our podcast. So, right, all right. Well, thank you, gentlemen. Thank you very Good much. luck to you. Thank Make you. a lot of money. As the festival wore on and the organizers explained to me that a couple of their speakers were not going to be able to make it, I said, well, wait a minute, maybe I can help out. Maybe I can get up and talk about some of the things that I've learned on my podcast, Encounters USA. Well, organizer... Savella Khalil was more than happy to agree, and soon enough, I was up on the platform talking about our favorite podcast, Encounters USA. So, Savella, Savella, you know, I keep showing up to these. I do so many mind games to remember your name, and I, I keep coming up. But the best one I have is the barber of Savella. The better way is Cadillac. Yeah. Ah. Yeah. Ah. <laughs> I drove up the Volkswagen. Uh, right. Can you guys hear me? Yes. Yeah. Can you hear me? No, that one All right. Um, thank you guys for coming. I want to first of all thank Savella, and I would like I would like to thank Tom for putting this thing on. Um, I think we're gonna quiet some people down in the back. All right, you guys, so uh, who am I and what the heck am I doing up here? My name is Matthew Hines, and I think you guys got that that joke. It was funny in the seventh grade, uh, in case you were wondering. But uh, the reason I'm up here is I do a podcast. It's called Encounters USA, it's also on YouTube, uh, by trade, I am a teacher, and I've always been fascinated by the subject. Um, at one point last year, I said, oh, I said, I want to I wanna do a podcast, and I started doing a podcast called Books in Hindsight, Hindsight, <laughs> and I'll tell you, it was boring me to tears. Um, I, I love books just as much as everybody, but I, whenever I would get somebody from the, the paranormal community, I would be so interested and I would get so many views and subscribers. I said, you know, I think that the paranormal stuff is really what people want to listen to and what people want to hear. I talked it over with my wife and she thinks I'm insane, but she said, okay, that, that's okay. Um, you just do whatever you want to do. And um, so I I changed my podcast from Books in Hindsight to Encounters USA. And what we do is we do Bigfoot, Aliens, and Dogmen. And are you guys familiar with Dogmen? Yep. Yes, because a lot of people are not. And I have people say, well, who is Dogmen? And I'm glad that you guys are up to speed on that. Now, the whole premise of my podcast is that these things are related. One way or another, they are somehow related. UFOs are related to Bigfoot. Bigfoot is related to UFOs, and Dogman no, no, is no, somewhere no. in between. Not related to UFOs. No, no. Who, okay, I have a shadow. You want UFO? 
Who's not related to UFOs? Not Bigfoot forever. Is it not related? No. Okay. Well, let me tell you what I base my uh, rationale on, and then you can tell me if you agree with that or not. Um, I've, I have a book I've written, it's called Deceptions of the Ages. And in that, I talk a lot about the connections between Freemasons, Mormons, and extraterrestrials. And you might go, what? What is the... If you read the book, you'll understand throughout history, there has been a... Um, the Freemasons have always had something to do with this stuff. And I don't know if there's any Freemasons in the audience right now, but um, as you listen to what I have to say, I, I think I'll make a little bit more sense. Now, um, the first thing that I, I say when I talk about Bigfoot and UFOs is, and I talk about this in my book, is I always bring up Spielberg and Lucas. You guys know who they are? Kind of famous directors. All right, well, my question is, why, if Bigfoot and UFOs are not related, why is Bigfoot in the Six Million Dollar Man in 1976? And why is Bigfoot in the Six Million Dollar Man in 1976 when in 1973 they had, um, in Pennsylvania, they had the, I cannot remember the name of that ridge that runs through Indiana, but they had these um, encounters with UFOs and Bigfoot were showing up. Um, and so three years later, uh, you have the six million dollar man is hiding Bigfoot on, uh, on TV, and a year later, Bigfoot is in Star Wars. So what is it that Lucas and uh, Steven Spielberg know, being Freemasons, that the rest of us don't? And why didn't people just laugh this off and say, what, you know, what, what is going on here? But everybody just kind of looked at it and said, well, I don't know, but I'm not going to say anything because I don't want to look like an idiot. So based on that, I started, um, when, I did, when I started my podcast, this is what I'm looking at. And so I want to talk to you right now, I'm not trying to name drop, but I have been able, I've had the honor of talking to Tom, which is a great coup for me. I've also had the uh, honor of talking to um, uh, Moorhead, um, I, I can't, yeah, Ron Moorhead, I'm just I'm losing my mind, I'm getting old. I have the honor of interviewing Ron Moorhead, and is, does anybody not know who he is? He was, have you seen David Politis' latest movie? Okay, well Ron, Ron was in the Sierra camp. And Ron was able to, they recorded vocalizations of Bigfoot. And when I was interviewing Ron, it was very interesting that as we're talking, I asked him, because if you don't know the story, does anybody not know the story of the Sierra camp? Anybody not know? Okay. If you watch the David Politis Missing Hunters 411 movie, David Politis does these books about people that disappear without a trace. Sometimes they're found, sometimes they're not. Well, in the Missing 411 movie, he documents all of these hunters that ended up disappearing. Some of them were found, some of them were not. And then, um, and, and this is something, I, I did a podcast about this that you could get more background on this, but... Um, one thing that I've always had against David Politis is, why don't you ever just give any, why don't you ever give any, uh, a, a reason these people are disappearing? Speculate, say something. And people will say, oh, what about Bigfoot? And what about uh, aliens or uh, crazy uh, ex-servicemen in the woods? And he always says, oh, there's nothing to do with that. There's no evidence for that. But then finally in this movie, he's coming out in the Sierra camp. And in the Sierra camp, Ron Moorhead is recording conversations they're having with Bigfoot. Now, um, I, I need to get Ron back on my podcast to talk some more about this, but what happened is these guys go up on their horses, they go up to this camp in the Sierras in, the, in Northern California. I don't know how far it is from Bluff Creek. I, I imagine it's not too far. It's a long way. Oh, it's a long way? I, I should never speculate. I'm never right about it. But, uh, but, but, but relatively, it's, it's closer than here, isn't it, Tom? So, so technically, I'm, I'm, I'm correct. So anyway, they're, they're in the Sierra camp, and um, they've been going out there since 1957. In 1974, they started to have uh, these Bigfoot were starting to come outside the camp. 
And um, to make a long story short, they had a conversation. They recorded the conversation, and the Bigfoot are saying something, and they're saying something back. Bigfoot says something, they say something back. Recorded it all, and then they turned this um, data they had over to some, an ex-Navy uh, um, sound engineer, and then a sound engineer at, I think, the University of Montana. And the Navy, what they came up with, I don't know who came up with exactly what, but the first thing they came up with is that whoever was speaking has a vocal range five of five octaves, which I don't know exactly what it means. Humans can't do it. So whatever was making these noises was definitely not human and had capabilities that humans do not have. Um, the other things that, uh, that Ron Moore had talked about in the movie were that at one point a fireman, a fireman, said he saw a Bigfoot standing right next to a UFO down the side of the mountain. And okay, well, if that's true, that's pretty weird. Ron Moorhead also said that he saw like a lightsaber just floating across the camp. And what was that? He said another, um, and if you've seen the movie, I don't want to go over the whole thing, but another one is that they, he said that it sounded like the whole camp was being torn apart. They walked out the next day and everything was in its place. So they can't figure out what it was. And then the last thing that I thought was very interesting is that somebody said they thought they heard a car door slam um, up here in the Sierra Mountains, okay? So um, this all gets me because I'm, I did my podcast because I want to know about the connections between the aliens and the Bigfoots, but I want to know who's also taking these people, and I want to know what's happening to them. So I think that um, when you get into aliens, Bigfoots, and um, dogmen, uh, we have some very serious candidates uh, for suspects. So um, very quickly, I just like you guys because in the information age, it's so hard to keep up with what information is current. And so from what I've been doing, because I hear people talking about stuff that, no, that, that's different. It's, it's not the same anymore. Um, people have come out with other evidence. So what I want to do right now is give you what I found in the, I've been doing this podcast for about five months, and I have found, I've talked to Melba Ketchum's uh, assistant, um, I've talked to Mr. Moorhead, I've talked to Rich Germo, who was the officer over in the Olympic Peninsula, and I've interviewed him, and I have found so many interesting things about Bigfoot that I would like to, to share with you. And starting with Rich Germo, and I talked with Tom about this, it seems that if Bigfoot finds you once, Bigfoot is going to find you again. Um, unless for some reason uh, Bigfoot doesn't like you um, or something and you end up a meal. Um, but Bigfoot tends to have a relationship with certain kinds of people. I've never had a relationship with uh, Bigfoot, so I'm probably not the kind of person that, uh, that would attract a Bigfoot. Um, probably wouldn't like my sense of humor. Um, but I've also had the chance to, um, oh, I just want to make sure that I uh, uh, finish off this Ron Moorhead uh, bit. When I'm talking to Ron, nobody had ever asked him about this before, but I said, well, what about this conversation that these Bigfoot had? And it is my firm belief that Bigfoot came to that camp because they wanted something. They wanted to talk to these guys. And I don't know if they needed help. I don't know if they just wanted to speak to people. But listening to Shadow talking about how they brought a baby uh, for him to see, they, you know, there's some things that these Bigfoot, they want to communicate with certain kind, kinds of people. And I think that they came out that camp, outside of that camp where, where Ron was and his friends because they wanted something. So what happened is they started making these vocalizations. And the person recording, when they uh, sent it for analysis, the um, engineer said, you have a big one. There's, uh, there's a big Sasquatch. And then there's like a female Sasquatch. And it sounds like there's other ones. I think, the, I think they said there was five. But there was definitely a big one. And then there was a smaller one that he kind of made sound like the wife, right? And I said, well, what's the conversation? He said, well, it sounds like the wife is telling him to go. He's, the wife is, taking, is doing all the talking and saying something to the big one, and then finally they just get up and go. It's like, honey, get the kids, let's get in the car, enough of this. Because I think that they were trying to do something, and I think the, the woman Sasquatch didn't, said it's not working. They just don't get it. 
So that's one thing that I, I have discovered in my venture on Encounters USA. And before I go too much farther, I just want to, have you heard the story of the Indian wise men and the elephant? Ever heard that story? There's a story about these Indian wise men, and they're all blind, right? They're philosophers, but they're blind. And they come across an elephant, and they go to the elephant, and they have never seen anything this big, and so they say, well, let's, let's take uh, a section of this animal, and let's find out what it is. So one of them feels a part of the leg and says, well, it's got, you know, it's very sturdy and long, and another one feels the trunk, another one feels the tail. In the end, they decide, well, this is, must be an elephant that we are, you know, feeling here. Well, this is what we're doing. We all have a little bit of information, and when we put it together, that's where we come up with, you know, knowledge, I guess. So what I'm trying to do is the same thing you're trying to do. Put together the pieces of information. So, I had the fortune of talking to Melba Ketchum. And have you guys heard of Melba? Melba Ketchum. All right, well, I'm not going to spend all day talking about this. Melba Ketchum did the first scientific study of DNA. Uh, it was collected, um, and I, I could talk for hours about this, and I won't. They collected DNA, they collected skin, hair, and blood samples, and they submitted them to a veterinary... Um, uh, researcher and Melba Ketchum's job is if there is a court case that involves an animal in Texas they go to Melba Ketchum for the DNA results so she is very credible and so people started giving her DNA results from Bigfoot the first person to give her a Bigfoot DNA was David Politis right? So, um, so David Politis, um, and what I was trying to say about David was that he's been looking for Bigfoot the whole time, but he just doesn't tell anybody that he's been looking for Bigfoot because nobody wants to get laughed at and not be taken seriously because he, you know, obviously sells a lot of books. So, Melba Ketchum gets uh, DNA evidence from uh, David Politis, and she submits her DNA evidence to 12 different labs. All these labs come back. Has nobody ever heard this story? It's amazing. This is like this is like Galileo. They tore this woman apart um, because she was a woman. Because she came out and said she was investigating Bigfoot, they just tore her apart. And not one person, David Politis, uh, Meldrum, none of these people stood up for her. They all just stood by and watched her get burned, basically at the stake in the you know 21st century. But what she found was that the Bigfoot have a human female mitochondrial DNA. Do you understand what that means? It means there is no Bigfoot mama. Mama is human. Okay. So how does that happen? And there is no Bigfoot DNA. They compared every all the DNA they had to the human genome. It's nowhere. There is a DNA sequence they have from the nuclear DNA. I, you know, I have to go back to my biology class in college. Uh, also, let me throw it back at uh, you just in case you're wondering about my credibility. My next door neighbor at Washington State University was Grover, Grover Krantz. You know who that, that is? No? Yeah. Guess I'm not so credible after all. But he was the first big, you know who he is, right, Tom? Okay, well, Grover was one of the first big uh, UFO researchers. In fact, he probably taught Jeff Meldrum. Uh, or, I'm sorry, Bigfoot researchers. But, I'm um, getting back to my point. There is a, that they could not place this Bigfoot DNA. So, I'm just going to kind of taper this, uh, this off to tell you what I found um, that kind of relates to this. The first thing is, based on Melba Ketchum's study, there is, the, the Bigfoot is made up of a human female and this uh, male, okay? Now, um, I don't know how many different types of Bigfoots there are out there, but I do believe from the people I've talked to that there is a big one. It's 12 to 15 feet tall, and that's the King Bigfoot. Um, I have heard, and these are all things that I put together from listening to people. I have heard people talking about 
Chinese uh, miners in the 1800s in Northern California being abducted, females. And possibly these, um, some of this DNA is coming from these Chinese females. And um, I had, I was talking to Sevilla, who was talking about these big pussy enough, a Chinese dialect in their language that they understand kind of an English and a Chinese dialect. So where does that come from? Um, but anyway, these are things that people are talking about and discussing seriously. So this is what we uh, know right now about Bigfoot. Um, this is what I found out about Bigfoot. And um, I've just basically opened uh, a, very, a very big door. But every day I find out more and more um, interesting information. And um, I'm not going to tell you what I think Bigfoot is. I'm not going to tell you um, what characteristics it has because I still want to keep an open mind. But there is a lot of really, really weird stuff um, about, the, about the creature, about the mystery. And again, I think it ties in to UFOs, and I think it ties in to our dogmen. And the last thing that I want to say is that we need to think as people that live in the United States of America, we have a Bigfoot, we have a dogman, and an alien. And what do these things all have in common? The government says they do not exist, right? But these things are, are hurting people. Uh, these things are out there, they're bothering people. They are a very serious issue, a very serious danger. And the government, I mean the UFOs are abducting people. The government's saying there's not there. So at some point, uh, we as Americans need to uh, start looking at how the government works and why do they not want us to know these things are out there? And um, what are we gonna do to make them, uh, you know, admit it? Now, the last thing I'm gonna say before I, I, I close is, I heard Shadow talking about getting this thing um, declared an endangered species. All right, so people talk about, oh yeah, go shoot a Bigfoot. Well, if you shoot a Bigfoot, What's going to happen is that the government's going to grab that thing, they're going to put you in jail for poaching, and they're, they're never, going to, never going to see your Bigfoot. So what, what good is that going to do? Um, the other one is, well, you can collect all this evidence like Melba Ketchum did, and then they can destroy your career. So at some point, people have to say, this is not the way uh, it should be done in the United States, maybe other countries, but it should be done this way in the United States. So if you guys are interested in these topics, in Dogman, in the mystery, I have a lot of very um, interesting people on my podcast. Next uh, week, I have um, Deborah Tavares, uh, who's talking about the heart. Uh, we're gonna start sending energy from space into your power stations, and not even asking us, like, what is this gonna do to us? You know, so uh, there's a lot of weird things that are going on now. So besides um, just being a plug for my Encounters USA podcast, if you guys are interested, please tune in and uh, support us. And um, also, I'd just like to say uh, thanks to Tom for being here. And I'd also like to say thank you to Sevilla for having me up here to talk. So uh, thank you, and I hope you all enjoy the rest of the afternoon. Altogether, it had been a very successful day in learning new things and new information about Bigfoot and Sasquatch. The only thing that I could regret was not having seen the picture that Tom Cantrell was dangling in front of us, but was failing to show us until the next day. So with a promise to come back, I said, well, maybe my wife will agree and we'll come back out the next day. So it was an iffy situation to be sure, but I had to try. And lucky enough, my wife loves me. So don't forget to stay tuned for the second part of this podcast, Marble Mount Bigfoot Festival with Tom Cantrell. If you're lucky, you might be able to hear me speak 
just one more time. Now, if you're going out to Marble Mount tomorrow, or if you're going anywhere out in the woods or in the places where few people go, remember what we always say at Encounters USA. Always watch your back. Thanks for listening to tonight's show. Please remember, if you've had an encounter, we want to hear about it. Go ahead and email us at EncountersUSA, numeral one, at gmail.com, or contact us at EncountersUSA.com, our website, and go to the contact form. All right, everybody. Until next time, be careful out there. And if you're out in the woods, watch your back.